Good morning. I'm happy to be here on this very special occasion. We all have had very good relationships with BASF over the years. They have a laboratory in our institute in Strasbourg. Very important for us to have this huge company, small part of it, but nevertheless around. And it's good for the students also to see that doing basic research in one part of the floor and then BASF, very close by, very friendly relationships. Now, today, you will get an injection of chemistry. I've tried to minimize it, so don't be too much afraid. But some of you are chemists, others maybe not. So I've tried to sort of be careful about the injection. So we talk about urban living, and of course, talking about urban living is, uh, has to do with chemistry, obviously. It has to do with air, we heard about that. It has to do with water, we heard about that. It has to do with construction, that's chemistry, all that. With clothing, color, personal care, communication. You don't have these little machines without any chemistry in them. Mobility, that's a bit strange way of mobility, but it's a mobility also. And so we are here. And I would like to give you some ideas about how matter is built up. We are part of it. We are matter, living matter. So, where did it start? If we want to describe the evolution of matter in the history of our universe, we have to start initially with divided matter. And then, because matter has a specific property, which we will be discussing a bit, complexity has increased and matter has become condensed. But condensation is not enough. It has begun to be organized, then it became living, we are part of that, but another property also appeared, thinking matter, and maybe something else later on. We don't know that yet, but we can't exclude it. And that's the way how matter evolved from the original Big Bang, where the universe was born, to what the point we are now occupying in space and time. It seems that matter has been driven by some kind of a property which you may call information in some regions of the universe, not in others. So now, what is the big question we can ask and we should ask? What I consider the big question is the following. How does matter become complex? How can you go from an elementary particle to a thinking organism? And maybe the higher forms of complexity in matter. But that is not for today, of course. So for giving an answer to that question, mankind has invented something which we can call science. And science can be considered, on one hand, to deal with the basic laws of the universe. That's physics. Biology deals with the rules of life, how things function in a living organism. And what is chemistry doing? Chemistry tries to beat the bridge. That's very important. How can you go from a general law to a specific expression of that law? The laws of the universe govern everything. But why this comes out and not that? And this is, of course, a very important question to know what is the pathway by which general laws lead to specific expression of those laws. The answer to the question is one word, self-organization. It means it has happened on the basis of the laws of the universe by itself. No, there is no designer there. This is the laws of our universe. And one can even claim that is more a philosophical step that it's a cosmic imperative. That our universe, the laws of our universe are such that 
it must organize somewhere. And very probably, I'm personally convinced, almost certainly, there are many living organisms and probably thinking organisms around our universe in the millions of exoplanets which are being discovered and so on. Now, but let's go back now to our business today. That's the grand picture. And I think as a scientist, we are sort of driven by the grand picture. Uh, we don't want just to be people washing glassware, distilling solvents. We want to have a picture behind and contribute to that picture. Same in industry. Now, mankind has found out something fantastic, absolutely fantastic. The greatest thing mankind has found out. This table shows you what our universe is made of. These are the bricks of matter. And you should realize, that by looking at this table, you know what all visible matter from the planet Earth to the end of our universe is made of. There's nothing else. These are the bricks. And we know them. It's fantastic. And in addition, that's the playground of chemistry. That's what we are doing. As chemists, we use these pieces and we combine them. And we play with them. It's a Lego set. It's a set where like children play. Now, chemists then over the years have started with atoms and tried to combine them to make large entities, combinations called molecules. And from the atom to the molecule, molecular chemistry was then progressively built up. How? By using connections, frameworks, ways to bind them strongly together, combining them, and by what chemists call covalent bonds, strong bonds, which then make up these buildings, which we call molecules. Milestones in molecular chemistry can be started with the synthesis, the making, the making of urea in a laboratory by Friedrich Wöhler in 1828. He used a non-living entity, an inorganic matter, ammonium cyanate, to build up urea, to make urea in the laboratory. This was very important, first of all, because it was a production, a transformation of matter from ammonium cyanate into urea. It was also important because at that time people were thinking that you could not produce in the laboratory anything present in a living organism without the help of a magic force called the vital force. Wöhler showed the vital force doesn't exist. There's no discontinuity between non-living and living matter. The objects are molecules, the objects are of the same type. Very important also in terms of outlook at the world. 150 years later, it was possible to make a much more complicated molecule in the laboratory. These were two groups led by Robert Woodward at Harvard, Albert Eschenmoser at the ETH in Zurich. They built up, to, with the help of a hard 100, and 100 people, 120 co-workers, this huge molecule, vitamin B12, from scratch. Scratch meaning from what we have seen in the periodic table a moment ago. 120, 150 men and women years have contributed to make that. I was postdoc with Woodward at that time. That's my part here. <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, it sounds funny, but I want to insist on that because, not because it's my part, but because we are scientists and we contribute a stone to science. That was my stone. Nobody's going to take it away from me. When you contribute something to science, it's your contribution. And I think this is something we should also teach the young people. Tell them, you do science and you contribute to enormous enterprise, which is understanding the world, understanding the universe, understanding us. Now, that was molecular chemistry. And of course, molecular chemistry, as you know, we have heard about this here. We know what BSF is doing. We know how many people are contributing to making more and more complex molecules, materials, properties, drugs, and so on. But the question comes up, is there something else we should look for? What you see here is a cancer cell with two killer cells. What are the killer cells supposed to do? They're supposed to find out which cells are cancer cells and kill them. How do they know the other guy is a cancer cell? Similarly, the blue dots is the HIV virus. This is a white blood cell. 
when the HIV virus hits a white blood cell, it can infect. How does, it, how does it know that the other one is now the target? It can infect. Something must happen between these biological entities, which tells each partner what the other one is. And this thing, that what happens, is obviously something happening between the molecules, which, contrary, which uh, form these entities. So when they get together, they know about each other. How? The molecules which build them up, especially their membrane, they will touch and have information which tells one what the other one is. And this then is a chemistry which is happening between the molecules and not inside the molecules. And this is what we have called then supramolecular chemistry because it's a chemistry which lies beyond the molecule, which deals with what molecules do when they get together. I sometimes call it also sociology of molecules. What do molecules do when they get together? They talk to each other, they like each other, they hate each other, they repel each other, they attract, and so on and so on. So that was this area which has been built up over the last 50 or so years. Now here, of course, we need, like in architecture, we heard a lot about that yesterday, some forces which hold them together. For molecules, we had a strong called covalent forces. For supramolecular entities, we have this gluing. It's not so much so strong, not nuts and bolts. It's more gluing things together, weaker interactions which hold these things together. And three basic functions have been, st have been studied over the years. The most important one is how do molecules recognize each other? What tells a molecule what the other one is? Which is, of course, the basis of everything. You are sitting here. Without molecular recognition, you don't exist. In your body, as you sit here, all molecules recognize each other. They must do the right thing at the right time, at the right moment, at the right part of your body. If not, you are finished. So that's the most basic property, of course. Reactivity, what do molecules do when they react with one another, when they want to transform each other? Transport is a very important property also. How do molecules regulate what goes in and out of a compartment, like a cell in biology? So recognition is the basic process, and there's a very simple way to describe recognition, which is, first of all, to realize that, of course, we have to have interaction. If no interaction, the bodies ignore one another. So a molecule has to interact with another one in order not to ignore one another. But that's not enough. Interaction, we know, non covalent bonds. But information is present. You cannot recognize without having information. So one has to realize that there's information in all these processes occurring in a living organism. And one can very, very simply describe and trivially describe it as a complementarity in geometry between the objects which could come together and in interactions. Plus attracts minus, plus repels plus. A picture has already been proposed by one of the greatest organic chemists who ever existed, Emil Fischer. In 1894, he said that for an enzyme to act on its substrate, they have to fit together like Schloss und Schlüssel, like a lock and a key. We know now that the lock is a bit soft, the key can adapt and all that. But basically, those are not chemists here. If they go back and remember that what happens in your organism is like locks and keys trying to find each other, that's already something. I have made my day. So what is important, therefore, is to see what is this information doing. And let's look at the most important of the information systems which happens, which is in our body. DNA, of course. Genetic information is what makes the difference between a tomato and an elephant, or between us and a mouse, for instance, or a fly. And what is it? It's a long strand, a chain, on which are fixed letters, very simple chemical groups, trivially simple for a chemist, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, and those are the letters with which all the genetic information of all living organisms is written. You realize that you are just the result of four letters in a given sequence? That's the famous double helix, because these letters 
these strands wrap around each other. How do they wrap around? This is the way in which the information which is stored has now to be read. And it is read by an interaction between these letters. Two letters make two points of interactions. Another two make three points of interactions. So what is it all about? It's an information system. Four letters, they write the program, and two ways of reading two or three points of interaction. The letters themselves are molecular chemistry. The interaction between them is supramolecular chemistry. And so one can claim that chemistry is not only a science of the structure and, info and uh, transformation of matter, which is usually what one accepts. It is very important to realize that chemistry is also an information science. It's a science of informed matter. All molecules carry information. All interactions with molecules are a way to read that information. And so the storage is molecular, and the processing of the information is supramolecular. This means that one can use this, handle that, design, engineer these molecules so that they will do a given process. You can program your system. Now, so that means that in 1828, molecular chemistry has been, so to say, started with the work of, uh, which we have seen, Friedrich Wöhler. And then using this synthetic molecular chemistry, one can build up locks for keys. You can call the locks receptors, which receive something else. And then supramolecular chemistry, in fact, I put the date because that's at the year where I have proposed the name of supramolecular chemistry, where by interaction between the key, the substrate, and the lock, the receptor, one builds up an entity, which is a supramolecular entity, which then can recognize, lead to recognition, transformation, or translocation, or transport. And this then is, leads to functional supramolecular systems. And we will hear about more about functional materials a bit later on by my good friend Bert Meyer. So, many, many studies have been performed around the world on these basic functions, recognition, reaction, and transport processes. No time to get into that, because we want to proceed further. How do you play with locks and keys? Using Emil Fischer's idea, this would be three keys. That's the lock. Obviously, the red lock is what fits. The red key is what fits. And this has been done by many, many laboratories, playing with locks, playing with keys, trying to understand how you have to shape your lock to bind a given key, or how to have to shape your key to go into a given lock. And this we will see, what does that mean? This is then part of applications. Basic research, as you know, is acquiring knowledge. And applied research is applying knowledge. And both have to work hand in hand. So the first important application is drug discovery. What is a question of making a drug? Making a drug is making a key for a biological lock and to make it as precise, as well as possible, so it goes exactly where it's supposed to go. Not simple, but that's the basic process. Then we had also been working for some time on other things, which came out of complete different types of uh, research lines we had in the lab. One of them was making a cage where you put in a little iron, one of those elements in the periodic table, the European iron, which has a red fluorescence, and we, that, this led to an uh, immuno system, which you see here, it's called Cryptor, which is now used in many hospitals for diagnosis. This unit serves as the nanobulb, which you can follow. Gene transfer has also been used for uh, this supramolecular chemistry because you can derive artificial units, synthetic vectors, which bind a piece of gene, a piece of DNA, and help it to go into the membrane, through the membrane, into the cell, and then be expressed. Finally, there's something else which I will insist on in a moment, also making biomaterials on the basis of supramolecular entities. Now, coming back to uh, this question, and the answer to the question I looked, we, I mentioned at the beginning, if you make locks for keys, or keys for locks, you pre-organize your system. You try to understand how to build it, how to make it, and then you test it. But you would like, in fact, 
to go one step further, to make systems which will self-organize, which will build themselves up on the basis of the components on which they are themselves built. In other words, you would like to set up systems which, on the basis of the information these components control, the bricks con contain, will spontaneously lead up to a complicated architecture which you can control and design and program. Let's give an example of a biological object which does that. This is a virus, the first one which was well understood, the tobacco mosaic virus. What is it? Nothing special. It's a bunch of molecules. It is formed by 2,130 bricks, protein units, represented by this thing, or if you want to be more simple, a piece of, of pie here, sort of triangular shape. And you easily understand that if these pieces of pie glue together side by side, they go around a circle, and if they don't join at the end, they make a helix. So that is indeed what happens. From these proteins, this is a, a more detailed structure that's even more detailed. They are complementary side, uh, side by side, self-complementary. So they bind together and they form a helix. And the size of the helix is controlled by the RNA, the genome of the virus in the middle. This looks magic. It's not magic. We understand everything there. We understand the organic chemistry, the structural chemistry, the interactions between them. And it works, and it, we can detail all the processes. There's no magic. It's chemistry and physics. So that is what happens in nature. And the virus is, of course, by far the simplest object by far. Much simpler than a living cell, of course, because a virus is not living. A virus is just at the brink between living and non-living matter. But then you ask the question, can you do that in a laboratory? And I would just like to illustrate that by a few examples. We had about architecture yesterday. Architecture means you have components, you put them together, and you make a building. Now, this chemistry can do. With one advantage, you don't have to put them, use them in place. They do it by themselves. So you have components, the bricks, which in this case will be organic molecules. You have metal ions, the cementing unit, those which will glue them together. And then you would hope to generate complex architectures. And let me just show you some a zoo. There's a whole an enormous amount of those objects have been formed. For instance, you can make double and triple helices, like DNA, of course, much smaller than DNA itself, but they form spontaneously on the way that it's designed. You can make these grid-like objects. You can make this thing, this I can insist a little bit, this looks like a, high, a skyscraper, a small skyscraper, I understand, only four floors. But these are four flat molecules. These are four pillar-like molecules. And there are 12 connectors, which are copper ions. You just mix in your pot, and you get it. These are circular architectures, which also with computers, you can make them look very nice, very colorful. But all this formed by themselves on the basis of design. And there are many laboratories around the world have worked in this area of building up what we call metallo supramolecular architectures. To cite a few, Makoto Fujita in Japan, Fraser Stoddart in the US, Jean-Pierre Sauvage in Strasbourg, and so on. These are ours. Now, this is also of interest for nanoscience and nanotechnology. Because nowadays, this fantastic machinery we have, you have to make it. You have to assemble it. You have to put it together. You have to fabricate it. It's very powerful. We know it's so powerful. But the next step would be, why not let it build itself up? Why not make pieces which find each other, which will build itself up, themselves up, and lead to the final product? In other words, self-fabrication is ultimate fabrication. We were asked at the beginning of this symposium to come up with some words, words for BSF. Self-fabrication is, of course, a word. I don't know have, how you would handle that. I don't think it will bring, us, bring you a lot of uh, money inside in the next 10 years. But ultimately, self-fabrication is a thing you have to look at. You descendants, probably. My descendants. 
One proof for that is that the most powerful computer we have around is the one between our two ears. It's self-organized. You don't make it. And it's self-organized based on molecules. So? so that's the ultimate fabrication. It's just a very, very long-term goal, but it is a goal. Now, what I showed you up to now is uh, doing chemistry by design. In other words, putting information in your components, programming the system, and letting it go. And then you generate a lot of complex architectures, as I have shown. But the next step towards more complex forms of matter is what? It is doing the same with selection. That means where you, the system itself selects from a diversity of objects the ones it needs to build itself up. Which means at first you need diversity, you need many, many, many different objects. You need dynamics, you need the system to explore the different combinations until it finds the best one. Now, nowadays, today, in my talk, the best one is thermodynamically the most stable one, where it has to find out. Of course, we know also there's another aspect of which we are part, which are thermodynamics out of equilibrium. Living is out of equilibrium, we know that very well. Someday we will become CO2, we will become CO2, yes. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to produce CO2, but we will become CO2. Ammonia, water, some calcium, some phosphate, and stuff like that. Not too much fun, but that's the way it is. So, selection leads then to an important next step, which is to make it to a chemistry where the constitution of your chemical object becomes to be dynamic. In other words, it's not fixed irreversibly. It becomes, to, it becomes dynamic. It may adjust, it may do something. We see that. This is a feature which is adaptation and leads to what adapt adaptive chemistry, which is now our main line of research. Another word for, to think about adaptation. Adaptive chemistry, I think, is one important part of chemistry of the future. It's developing in many laboratories, also in people sitting in this room. And it's very important because these systems, they will be able to respond to what is going on, to light, to pressure, to heat, and to other effectors. So, this supramolecular chemistry, because the connections between the bricks are rather weak, they can fall apart and reform and refall apart. So they can explore the combinations. And this can also be done in molecules if the connections between the atoms, holding the atoms together in a molecule, are made reversible. Now, all chemical bonds, of course, reversible. But that is not an answer to the question. The answer to the question is that you want to do it in conditions which are soft conditions. You don't want to break a bond which requires to heat and so on. You want to do it in soft conditions. This makes that possible adaptation by changing the internal structure, the constitution of your chemical object, and leads then to some approaches, which I haven't time to get into, except for the material side. A new way of finding out biologically active substances, let's say, to formulate it in one sentence, the lock builds up its own key. In other words, if adaptation is possible, the lock will find the pieces which can best be bound, that means it builds up its key. That is what we call dynamic combinatorial chemistry. You can make dynamic nanostructures, not for today, and develop dynamic materials. I would like to finish on that. So, these dynamic materials are materials where, at least for the moment in the laboratory, the pieces which make it up are linked by reversible connections. And these reversible connections can be either covalent bonds, molecular covalent bonds, but which have a, a way to go back and forth to be reversible, and non-covalent bonds, which by nature, intrinsically, are like this, reversible. And I like to call on the polymer area these dynamers, dynamic polymers, where the connections between the monomers are reversible connections. They can be molecular dynamic, and then in that case, this is one component, one unit, uh, monomer, 
which has reaction groups which are complementary to those ones, the yellow ones, and then they just polycondense to give this type of polymer. That's a reversible covalent polymer. On the other hand, these units can be recognition groups, the red recognition group, complementary to the yellow one, giving now a dynamic polymer, which is supramolecular type. This type of materials should present properties linked to this reversibility, which, is, which are self-healing, they may be responsive, they're adaptive to the medium, to the environment, and therefore they may lead to adaptive materials and technologies. This is for living. Our systems are all like that in, our, in us. They are able to adapt, but also we maybe someday will need that also for our cities, for our life around the world. Now, let me just show you some examples. This is, I can't tell you the structure of that polymer film which we made, and you cut it in two, you superimpose the two ends here, you press with your fingers, and you can stretch. It sticks. And this is now being investigated at BSF, at Lemförde in Germany. It's a very simple film constitution, but you just cut, superimpose, you press, and you can stretch. And it keeps almost its full strength. Now, something else, which also has to do with the work of Bert Myers, sitting here. I hope I have not uh, already seen something you would like to say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we had developed these supramolecular polymers a long time ago, and many contributions, and especially the group in Eindhoven has fan done fantastic contributions to this area. Uh, out of these supramolecular polymers of a given type, a small company, Xeltis, has developed biocompatible polymers, which have been used to make cardiovascular implants for cardiac reconstruction. Let me just show you the result. Here is the result. This is Leo Bocchiaia, who is a professor at the Institute for Cardiovascular Surgery Center in Moscow, Bakulev Center. And this is the young girl, Dominika, who was implanted now about four years ago. Uh, yeah. No, sorry, two years ago. And uh, she's well. And so, you know, for having worked on this, it's something fantastic to know that somebody around the world is jumping around having some of this stuff in her body. And ton more, now probably more than 10, have been implanted since then. So, he looks like a real surgeon, doesn't he? <laughs> Strong man. <laughs> I didn't know him, but I think it's really quite something. He's a very nice person also. Okay. Now, this was supramolecular polymers. What about dynamic covalent polymers? What is the idea there? The idea is you have a unit which has two functional groups which can reversibly condense with two other ones and then give a polymer, which here is this polyimine for chemistry in the, in the room, two carbonyl groups condensing with two amine groups giving these polyimines, and these are reversible. Now, Mitsu Chemicals had a good collaboration with us. We worked with them for many years uh, in order to try to exploit what these dynamic polymers could do. And they prepared some polyamines, which are, you see, the nice films they made. They make very nice films of these polyamines. And they also showed that these were very interesting ones in terms of their properties, because although they were constituted with, with degradable materials, the degradability was not the one which works easily. In other words, by introducing imines which easily hydrolyze in the environment, you shorten your chain, and then the rest is now biodegradable. Now, uh, you can also make dynamers which can be used and which have proper the properties can be illustrated in the following way. Suppose you make a film of a a polymeric film, which is constituted of A, B, A, B, A, B units. You make another film constituted of A prime, B prime, A prime, B prime units. You superimpose the two. 
if these connections are reversible, they can cleave here and recombine differently, making A combining with B prime and A prime combining with B. Because they can break and then they reconstitute with the film below. Now, if that's the case, you generate two new combinations which were not present before that, and therefore those may have new properties which the one, the films at the beginning, did not have. Let's illustrate that. You use imine type bonds. That's a question of using for mechanodynamics. This chain, forget about the constitution, leads to a very soft, very stretchy, mechanically very uninteresting film. Now, the chains here are very floppy, very flexible. Now we add monomers, which you can call hard monomers, monomers which are less flexible, still flexible, but not so much anymore. And you can now enter those into the chain because the bondings here, these C and W bonds, are reversible. So they can break, reform, break, reform, and incorporate the new ones. As a result, you get now a mixed unit, a mixed polymer, where you incorporate CD into the AB chain. What's the result? 25%, it looks better already. 50% is now tough enough not to bend down anymore under its own weight. 75% it's tougher, but still flexible. So you can transform progressively a soft, stretchy, floppy film into a tough one. And you can stop anywhere along the way. Of course, looking at the colors of those things, nobody at BSF would be interested in this as it is, but the principle is there. What about optical properties in these films? Again, we have an AB, we have A prime, B prime. Two films, and none of them has a strong optical property. This is colorless, not fluorescent, maybe some color, a little bit of fluorescence, but not much. You superimpose. At the place where it's superimposed, you can now have two new combinations, of course, A with B prime and B with A prime. Now, if one of those new combinations has a color, you will see it. Or if it fluoresces, you will see it. So, again, with my co-workers, Spitsui has sent to Strasbourg at that time. Here is a nice drawing. Japanese people like these nice little pictures. And you have a head, ears of the cat, that's AB. Moustache, eyes inside of the ears, A prime, B prime. Now you eat, color, fluorescence, only when it is superimposed, which shows what you expect, that a new combination has been formed, which is a, color, a colored one and has also fluorescence, and only when superimposed. It proves, therefore, that the thing works. That's where it happens, uh, the uh, recombination. And it shows also that you should be able, if you make very nice films, like you in the room here, some of you can do, you can write at the interface with a laser heater. And if you make a stack, like a milfeuille, you can write in three dimensions. Probably even with different lights, you can write different things with different colors and lights and so on. So, a lot of things to dream about. So, you have these artists' optical materials, which can then be used to store information, to read it, and so on. Last example I would like to show is a self-healing film. I've already shown you one of supramolecular nature. Now I show you one of molecular, covalent nature. That's this film. You see, we are not too good at making films. This looks a bit terrible for somebody who knows to how to make films. But it is a film, okay? Now, this is based on what chemists call a dissolved reaction. You cut it in two, you superimpose it, you press it with your fingers, and you can pull. It sticks. That's another example of, of self-healing material, but on the basis of molecular, reversible covalent bonds, and not of supramolecular bonds. So, I have given you a short path through more and more complex forms of matter, getting closer and closer to the complexity of what we know as very complex matter, that means living matter. And we start with molecular chemistry, because without molecules, you have nothing. Molecules are the basis, the basic bricks. But alone, if they ignore each other, 
still not much is happening. So they have to get together and form supramolecular architectures. Then they have to organize in a given way on the basis of how they are built and how they interact. Then they have to become dynamic in order to explore, to be able to adapt, and this is a way towards complex matter. Now, the fact that chemists are able to reconstruct matter, matter which nature has not made, when I call it, we are part of nature anyway, but matter which does not exist in the environment as we know it and not in us, chemists can do that. They can make all these combinations which do not yet exist. And a very famous artist, scientist, and engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, wrote a fantastic sentence. If you speak Italian, you read the top. In English, where nature finishes to produce its own species. Man begins using natural things. What is that? The periodic table of the elements, the bricks we have at our disposition. In harmony with this very nature, the laws of physics, you cannot get along with that. Harmony with the, with the laws of physics, because you cannot do anything else. They control. And then comes the ending, which I think, especially Leonardo da Vinci was an artist. It's a very strong statement to create an infinity of species. Very strong. So, one can claim that the essence of chemistry is not just to discover what is around. Of course it is to discover. But chemistry has also the power to create. The book of chemistry has to be written, not just read. The score of chemistry has to be composed, not just played. This is again reflected in a uh, sculpture of Auguste Rodin, where the hand of the heart artist expresses out of the stone a sculpture which is not in the stone. It's the artist which makes it. Who makes it? That's chemistry. Chemistry is the creative power. Now, speaking of creation, obviously, BSF creates chemistry. Thank you.